the official ball of the 1986 NCAA Men's and Women's Basketball Championships. In the afternoon's first semifinal, the Louisville Cardinals, a team that is maturing and peaking at just the right time, faces the LSU Tigers, who reach Dallas despite a mid-season rash of injuries and a bout with the chicken pox. LSU is the lowest seeded team ever to reach the Final Four, and they almost didn't make it. They barely escaped their first round game, beating Purdue in double overtime. In the second round, the Tigers needed a last-second off-balance shot by junior guard Anthony Wilson to squeak past Memphis State. In the regional semifinals, the Tigers shocked top-seeded Georgia Tech, a team many felt would wind up in Dallas. And in the regional finals, LSU upset Southeastern Conference champion Kentucky, a team that had beaten the Tigers three times during the season. The Louisville Cardinals entered the tournament, having won 15 of their last 16 games and the championship of the Metro Conference. The Cardinals routed Drexel 93-73 in the first round and then disposed of Bradley, a team that had lost just twice the entire year. The Cardinals continued their march toward Dallas by whipping North Carolina by 15 points and then beat Auburn to earn their fourth Final Four berth of the 1980s. Despite the obvious camaraderie of the two mascots, these two basketball teams hardly know one another. They've played each other just go, once go, since 1948. Go, go, go. LSU's freak defense, a confusing combination of zone and man-to-man, -man, gives Louisville fits in the early going. Don Redden passes ahead to John Williams. LSU leads 7-2. Louisville patiently looks for the open man. With no one open on the floor, the Cardinals look above the floor. When freshman Purvis Ellison lands, the score is 7-4. LSU's defense stays tough. Derek Taylor leads the fast break. He takes the return pass and hits LSU's fifth field goal in their first six attempts for an 11-4 lead. LSU keeps it going. Anthony Wilson's shot is put in by six foot six Ricky Blanton, who played center through much of the Tigers' injury and illness problems. The Cardinals are also shooting well, 67% to be exact. Milt Wagner ties the score at 19. Late in the half, though, Louisville misses seven straight shots, and the Tigers take advantage. Anthony Wilson follows his own miss. Moments later, Taylor feeds Wilson. LSU takes an eight-point lead into halftime. Despite the deficit, Louisville coach Denny Crum was optimistic heading into the second half. Being down eight points at halftime uh, is always a concern, but I didn't think we could play much worse, and I didn't think they could play much better and I told him we just had to tighten up eight points. It's just a matter of a two or three minute span. And I said, it's just a question of us putting more pressure on them defensively, taking away a few of the things that they want to do, and then doing a little better job of execution on our own part. Midway through the second half, the Tigers lose their shooting touch. And the Cardinals begin to execute. Billy Thompson feeds Milt Wagner. LSU cuts off the baseline, but Wagner is there to finish the break. Louisville then takes command of the boards. Billy Thompson soars to bring the Cardinals to within four. As LSU continues to miss, Louisville unleashes a devastating fast break. Jeff Hall feeds Milt Wagner, and Louisville takes its first lead of the game, 56-54 with 13 minutes to go. The onslaught continues. The Cardinals hit five of their next six shots and open up a 10-point lead with 10 minutes remaining. Coach Dale Brown will try anything to get his team going, and his Tigers respond. Wilson helps LSU crawl to within four. But then Louisville's size begins to dominate. Purvis Ellison goes over the outman Tigers. 
Moments later, Jeff Hall beats his man inside. Louisville's lead is back to 10. Denny Crump felt that Louisville's superior depth was the difference. The pace was in our favor, I think, uh, primarily because uh, we had more depth than they did. We had played a pressing style uh, of game all year. And when you play that style of game, uh, usually the last four or five minutes of a game, you're better than your opponent because you're in better condition than most of them. Uh, you have uh, a feeling of confidence that eventually your pressure will get to the opponent. And in, and in most cases, it did. In this case, it certainly did. LSU shot 35% in the second half. Louisville's fast break shifts into high gear. Milt Wagner feeds Herbert Crook. And Ellison provides the finishing touches to an 88-77 semifinal victory. The afternoon's second semifinal matches up this year's winningest teams, the Duke Blue Devils and the Kansas Jayhawks. This is the seventh trip to the Final Four for Kansas. Only four schools have been involved in moving. The Jayhawks earned the top seed in the Midwest region by virtue of their 35 victories and the championship of the Big 8 Conference. They were not severely tested in the first two rounds, beating North Carolina A&T and then Temple in convincing fashion. But in the regionals, Kansas had to overcome a six-point deficit in the final minute of regulation to overcome Michigan State. And in the regional finals, the Jayhawks overcame another second-half deficit to hold off North Carolina State. Duke is the only team besides Kentucky's 1948 team to win 36 games in one year. But the Blue Devils had to survive a scare in the first round against upstart Mississippi Valley State. Then they shifted into high gear whipping Old Dominion, the Sunbelt Conference regular season champion, and getting by surprising DePaul in the regional semifinal. Duke then dropped anchor on Navy, ending the Middies Cinderella dreams in convincing fashion. Duke and Kansas are certainly no strangers, having played each other earlier in the season. Mike Krzyzewski's Blue Devils beat Larry Brown's Jayhawks in the championship game of the 1985 preseason NIT. In the early going, Kansas seems determined to even that school, connecting on several fast break baskets. Danny Manning's hustle leads to a Cedric Hunter layup. When Duke's Mark Allery misses from the outside, Greg Dryling's rebound starts another fast break. Calvin Thompson puts the Jayhawks up by six. Two early fouls on star forward Danny Manning force Kansas into a more cautious defense. Duke quickly takes advantage. Mark Allery works free inside. Nine straight points capped by this basket by All-American guard Johnny Dawkins give the Blue Devils the lead with 12 and a half minutes remaining in the first half. Reunion Arena then becomes Dawkins' personal showcase. Hitting from all angles, the College Player of the Year scores 15 of Duke's first 25 points. And the Blue Devils take a six-point lead with four minutes to go in the half. But even with Manning and the seven-foot driving and early foul difficulty, Kansas fights back. Forward Archie Marshall narrows the gap. Calvin Thompson goes way up to cut Duke's lead to three at halftime. After stretching their lead to seven points early in the second half, Duke suddenly turns cold, missing eight of their next nine shots. Mark Turgeon feeds Kellogg. And the Jayhawks are flying. Coach Brown liked that one. And he loves this one. Kansas hits four consecutive shots and takes a 56-53 lead with 9.43 to go. Duke stays close with some timely foul shooting, but the Blue Devils continue to have problems from the field.
Kansas cashes in again, but this is a bittersweet basket. Archie Marshall's knee injury will require more than a year of rehabilitation. While his teammates are shooting a combined 37%, Duke's Johnny Dawkins picks up the slack. 65-63 Kansas, 340 to play. Meanwhile, Duke's Mark Allery shuts down Manning, holding him to a career low two field goals. At the other end, Manning's frustration results in his fifth foul on this beautiful backdoor play from David Henderson to Allery. The game is tied with just under three minutes to go. Amazingly, with Dryling, Manning, and Marshall on the bench, the Jayhawks still hang tough. Calvin Thompson grabs the loose ball and makes it 67-65 Kansas. With under two minutes to go, the Blue Devils look to Tom. Henderson misses, but Dawkins is there for his 24th point of the game. 67 67, 149 to go. Kansas fails to retake the lead, and Duke works the ball to senior Mark Allery. Freshman Danny Ferry scrambles for the rebound, and Duke goes ahead with 22 seconds to go. Cedric Hunter works the ball up court looking for Kellogg, who leads Kansas with 22 points. Kellogg has missed just three of 14 shots all day, but he can't get this 16-footer to fall, and when Tommy Amaker grabs the rebound for Duke, the Blue Devils earn their ticket to the championship game. Amaker's free throws make the final margin four. Duke's seventh victory in eight games this year decided by five points or less. After some 4,000 games, the NCAA championship comes down to one game between the nation's two hottest teams. Duke has won 21 straight, and the Blue Devils' 37 victories is an NCAA single-season record. Denny Crum thought Duke's number one ranking was well-deserved. I thought when I saw them play early in the year that they were the best team I had seen. Uh, it was early in the year, but as the year went along, I think uh, they proved that uh, that was accurate. Uh, they'd won 21 in a row coming into the finals of the tournament, and, and they were playing as well or better than anyone, and that's why they were ranked number one, and rightfully they should have been. Denny Crum is in his 15th season at Louisville. The Cardinals have reached the final four six of those 15 years, including four times in the 1980s. The Cardinals suffered six losses during a brutal early schedule but they rebounded to win 16 in a row and 20 of their last 21. The teams exchange baskets early until Duke's Johnny Dawkins takes over. The All-American guard hits 11 points in the first four minutes. Dawkins sparks the Blue Devils to an 11-2 spurt and a five-point lead. Coach Crum has great respect for Dawkins' ability to control the game. Well, Dawkins uh, was a great guard. He has been ever since he's been at Duke and uh, had a lot of attributes that uh, I like in guards. One, he had great jumping ability, uh, his tremendous quickness, uh, even probably more than both of those factors, and they are crucial. Uh, he was a great sh shooter with senior experience, and that kind of leadership is hard to overcome. Louisville's backcourt has yet to score a single point, but the front line is alive and well. Freshman Purvis Ellison cuts the deficit to three. The Blue Devils respond with nine for nine foul shooting, and this basket by senior Mark Allery, giving Duke a 31-23 lead with six and a half minutes to go in the half. Louisville's backcourt still can't hit a shot. Senior Milt Wagner misses from short range. But Ellison is there for the rebound. <laughs> Meanwhile, Duke is having problems of its own. Five turnovers late in the half, combined with Ellison's outstanding play, helped the Cardinals tie the game at 33. 
Duke misses 11 of its last 15 shots of the half, but David Henderson leaves two Cardinals on the deck and gives the lead back to the Blue Devils. And not surprisingly, the half ends the way it began. Dawkins hits his 15th point of the half. And Duke takes a three-point lead into the locker room. In the first half, Dawkins' teammate shot a grand total of 7 for 21 from the field. But early in the second half, the other Blue Devils start to contribute. Duke's lead is up to five, following this gorgeous baseline move by Henderson. Senior Billy Thompson can't find the range, but Louisville's super freshman, Purvis Ellison, rallies his team again. Ellison then decides to show he can do more than just score. This soft touch pass leads to a Herbert Crook basket, giving the Cardinals their first lead since the game's opening minutes. Denny Crum believed those opening moments of the second half were crucial. We try to uh, strive very hard to, to concentrate really hard on the first five minutes of the second half uh, for two reasons. One, I think that's always a crucial part in a game in relation to setting the tempo like you want it. But even more than that, they're coming out of a locker room with fresh in their minds the things that you've just talked about that you have to be able to do in the second half. Dawkins knows what he has to do. He shows his velvet touch for seven quick points in the next minute and a half. With his Blue Devils back in the driver's seat, point guard Tommy Amaker looks to set it up inside. With everyone covered, he lets go a rainbow, and the Blue Devils take a six-point lead with less than 12 minutes to go. As if that weren't enough bad news for Louisville, seniors Billy Thompson and Milt Wagner were on the bench with four fouls each. The Cardinals struggled to stay close. Tony Kimbrough misses, but McSwain grabs a key rebound. He spots senior guard Jeff Hall, who hits a key basket from the circle to narrow the game. As Louisville starts its comeback, Denny Crum knows he can rely on more than just his seniors. Well, with Thompson and Wagner both having four fouls, that was certainly an area of concern that uh, I was hoping I didn't have to, to deal with. But uh, one of the things about this team was that we had good depth and that we, throughout the course of the season, uh, for different reasons and a lot of times on purpose played guys in crucial situations that maybe weren't starters and uh, I think that really helped us uh, coming down the stretch. One of those non-starters, Mark McSwain, gets the ball down low. He brings the Cardinals to within one. Moments later, Duke gets a break. Amaker's pass is deflected but it rolls right into the hands of Henderson. And Duke leads 61-55 with just over seven minutes to play. But the Cardinals come right back. McSwain finds Ellison inside. Duke's lead again is cut to four. On the other end, Jeff Hall and his Louisville teammates continue to harass Dawkins, who hasn't scored a field goal in 10 full minutes. Senior Milt Wagner decides to take matters into his own hands. The result is a three-point play that pulls the Cardinals to a then one with five and a half minutes to play. With Hall covering Dawkins like a blanket, Duke looks elsewhere for scoring. But the Blue Devils miss their fourth consecutive shot. Louisville decides to talk it over. With Dawkins shut out from the field in the last 11 minutes, Mike Krzyzewski needs scoring from his other veterans. While Denny Crum tries to sustain the defensive intensity that has brought his team to the brink of the lead. Aware that Allery and Billis are playing with four fouls, Crook finds Milt Wagner inside. 
Louisville leads by one with less than two minutes left. The Blue Devils just can't buy a basket. Dawkins gets off only his second shot in the last 15 minutes. But Crook steals the rebound. And the Cardinals want to talk it over again. With playback in, Hall looks for a shot. As the shot clock runs down, he puts up a prayer. And the prayer is answered by none other than freshman Purvis Ellison. Purvis, never nervous, is psyched. Ellison has his team up by three. Duke's dry spell from the floor reaches nearly seven minutes. When Allery fouls out on this key rebound, Ellison has a chance to put the game on ice. If Purvis is nervous, he certainly doesn't show. Two free throws under enormous pressure give Louisville a five-point lead with 27 seconds remaining. Amaker misses from long range. But Billis gives Duke its first basket since the 7-19 mark. The Blue Devils are within three. The Cardinals work the ball inbounds. And Duke is forced to send Louisville senior Billy Thompson to the foul line. Everyone in Reunion Arena can feel the tension. Fifteen seconds to go. Duke can cut it to one. the handle and Curry makes it close with three seconds on the clock. Duke's only chance is to foul. Louisville gets it into the hands of senior Milt Wagner and Duke must pray that Wagner misses from the line. Wagner doesn't miss. Denny Crum wins his second NCAA championship in six years and Louisville becomes only the ninth school in NCAA history to win two basketball championships. Ellison is the first freshman in 42 years to be voted MVP of the Final Four. Crum saw some definite similarities with this team and his championship team of 1980. This team was very similar to our team in 1980. We were senior guard dominated. Like We had Daryl Griffith and Tony Branch and uh, senior guards this year. We had Milt Wagner and Jeff Hall. Uh, we also had another very unique situation. We had a freshman center named Purvis Ellison. I really feel good about the team, better than I did earlier, I guess, because we've done it. A coup de ville, the 1986 NCAA Final Four Highlight Show, has been brought to you by Spalding Sports Worldwide, maker of the official ball of the 1986 NCAA Men's and Women's Basketball Championships. This has been an NCAA Productions presentation.